Ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, welcome to the meeting of the Institute of National Statistics. Well, this is the year where we have a lot of problems. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Does the microphone work like that? No? Uh, maybe try that one. Uh, I already tried to pull it out. Oh, right here. Right here. Is that better? Is it better? Yeah? Okay, cool. Um, okay, uh, yeah, so first of all, wow, thanks a lot for the uh, very kind introduction. Uh, <laughs> it's slightly embarrassing, but <laughs> um, and, and of course, you know, I'm very grateful to the uh, organizers uh, to invite me to give these world lectures. Uh, it's a great honor, and I'm grateful for you to be here in person. It's very nice to be back to having meetings in person. Um, so today and tomorrow. So the topic of the lectures is going to be, well, as you see, sort of universality and crossover in one plus one dimensions. Uh, so what's the kind of story here? Okay, so I just try to give you some sort of overarching feel for what's going on first. Um, and so, so what we're trying to study here in general, so what the purpose, if you want, of the whole story would be, um, is, well, you take a process that depends on space and time. So the kind of thing that you can imagine is some sort of model for a one-dimensional interface that separates two regions in a two-dimensional substrate or something, right? So it depends on time coordinate because it moves in time and it depends on a one-dimensional spatial coordinate because maybe it's a graph over a line or something like that. Um, and the kind of properties that you would have is, well, as already said, so space is one dimensional and time is, well, time is always time. So it's always one dimensional. 
uh, it's translation invariant, or at least maybe translation invariant by the integers or something like that. Right? So you want some kind of stationarity in space. Um, and you would also want it to be, say, station either stationary in time or at least have a sort of stationary version uh, in time. And the last property here, so I call it well, local. I guess this thing doesn't work quite as well as I thought. Okay, so like approximately local specifications. So what do I mean by this? Well, so local in time <clears throat> would basically mean that it's a Markov process. When I say approximately local means in principle, you know, you would allow for a little bit of memory if you want, but it should be, you know, very short range. It shouldn't be something with some sort of a, a memory kernel that only decays like a power law or things like that, right? So that we don't want to look at. And the same in space. So you would want local specification in space, which means that <clears throat> you have some kind of update rule want some sort of random update rule, but the update rule at a given location only depends on sort of what the shape of the function looks like um, in a sort of small region around that location, but doesn't depend on, you know, what happens really, really far away. Okay, so only quite local. Um, and furthermore, we want that specification to only depend on the shape of the function and not its value. So what I mean is that everything is not just translation invariant by horizontal translations, but also by vertical translations, right? So in the sense that if I add a constant to H and then let it evolve, that's the same as letting it evolve and then adding a constant, okay? So in that sense, the evolution doesn't actually depend on the value. It just depends on, you know, what the function, the sort of increments of the function. This doesn't Can work. Work. Okay, I use that one. Is that better? Okay, great. But what's the to say? Yeah, okay, I, I might wander out of the. No, it shows a, it shows a lot. I think I'm doing it. Yeah. I don't know how to do that. So, okay, so the specification only depends on the shape of the function, right? So I'm going to give a few examples in a second, but then what we're interested in is the large scale behavior of these kind of models. And so the question in general is, you know, for which sort of models and you'd expect us to be true for all of them, um, you know, can you find two experiments, which I call alpha and beta here, so that if I rescale things by, you know, some epsilon in space, so I look at the large scale behavior, and then I rescale time appropriately, so maybe. Maybe it has to be rescaled differently. If you can use hyperbolic scaling, then that would be decay for two. And if it's hyperbolic, so it would be decay for one, or it could be some other scaling. Um, and then maybe you have to rescale the values themselves. So there's another experiment alpha, which tells you how the values of the function have to be scaled. And then maybe there's some sort of odd large number that you have to subtract. I think we mentioned that um, the models we're interested in have this property that. The way it evolves doesn't do the value of the function. And that means you can very easily pick up some kind of grid uh, that makes you move off to sort of either plus infinity or minus infinity or some linear security, uh, and then you subtract that linear grid. Okay. So you're really interested in the fluctuations and not in the sort of large number if you want. Um, right. And so then the question is what sort of experiments can show up and what kind of limits. And so just as a matter of terminology, so in this kind of business, when uh, physicists or mathematicians talk of a universality class, the interpretation here of the word universality class just means all possible models that when you perform this kind of rescaling converge to the same limit, right? So you have different possible limits um, under these kind of rescalings. And each limit has a basin of, of attraction. So there's a whole class of models that will converge to the same limit. And then you call that a universality class. Um, now, right, so here's a, the first example. And that's the one that you're 
probably many of you at least probably in the room would have seen that. Um, that's what's called sometimes in the physics literature, it's called the solid on solid model. Um, in the probability literature, it's more called the like, symmetric simply <coughs> process, except it's a high function for the symmetric process. Uh, and here the evolution is as follows. So space is discrete, so space is just there. Um, and the values of the function are also discrete. And the high function has the property that neighboring values always differ by exactly plus or minus one. One at fixed time, it looks like some kind of random walk in space. Uh, so here the horizontal axis is space, not time. And the evolution is as follows. Every side has a Poisson clock. And whenever the Poisson clock rings, so say this one rings, the one with the red dot, um, then if it's a local maximum, then it flips over to a local minimum. And then if it's a local minimum, it flips over to a local maximum. And then it may happen that it's neither a local maximum nor a local minimum. And in that case, it just does not. Um, so that's a very simple model, which is of that type, right? So it clearly has the property that the way it evolves doesn't depend on the value, right? I didn't have to put an origin on the on the vertical axis in order to describe what's going on. Um, it also clearly has the property that everything is sort of local, right? The rule it only depends very locally on the shape of the function. Around the point, and everything is clearly stationary. And well, so this model is very well known that the correct way of rescaling it is that in time you have to do parabolic scaling, you have theta equal two, and the height has to be rescaled by alpha for a half, which means that in space it should have a bunch of Brownian rescaling. So in space it should have Brownian rescaling. Uh, which is natural, so there's a natural initial condition for this, which is so far on both sides, and another one, you will not go down in this case, which is the so far in motion. It turns out that running in motion or uh, running walk is actually an invariant measure for that process. So if you start with a random walk of your initial condition, and you look at what happens at later time, what you can receive is again just a random walk, except that you sort of randomly shift. Um, so it preserves up to high shift, it preserves the random walk measure. And so the gradually scaling space is clearly the problem. Uh, and the limit can easily be described. So the limit is not just a random motion in space. So if you want to view it as a time process, uh, then the limit is what's called the Edwards Wilkinson model. Or the stochastic heat equation that solves this stochastic heat. Right? So that's the description of the limit of the Gaussian process. Um, and it solves this linear equation, which is the term here, which is space time white noise. It's just try here, it's space time white noise. So generalized Gaussian process with the correlation, the delta and space. Okay. Um, so let me just show you what this looks like. So this is what this looks like. Okay. So you see that for this time, this sort of looks like a brown motion. But this is a brown motion, but also the brown motion in space that also evolves in time. Um, also, just one remark, which is somewhat important is you can ask yourself what sort of symmetry that you have. So there's two obvious symmetries, which is obviously symmetric on the flipping space around. It's obviously symmetric on the flipping space around. Uh, and it is maybe not totally obvious, but still quite easy to see. But it's also symmetric on the flipping high around. Okay, at least if you start with the stationary guy. Uh, you run the movie I showed you, you can run it forward or backwards. You know, um, in some sense, you can kind of see that in the sense that, you know, if you uh, think of how these uh, 
how do you speak there to the who or has any traction in a way that they can be part of the a feature that you can see from this group of how to do directional path. Um, okay, so now here's another example. So that's the logistical um, So again, the high function is discrete. So again, state is discrete and the values are discrete. And the way to interpret it is such is that you really have a kind of quick pattern. The high function is just the top of the final brick. Uh, so I have indication the position of the top of the brick uh, in the pie. And the way the bricks tie up is that again there's a Poisson plot uh, on every side. When the clock rings, there's a brick that falls from the sky uh, and it's just tied up. And of course, if you only did that, it wouldn't be interesting at all. Uh, what happens is that you know if it rings right here, then the uh, the brick also sort of sticks to its edges, right? So here, if the brick falls down, it actually sticks to the bottom brick. If so that's the way these bricks tie up, um, and here it's much more harder to do. So there's no mathematical theorem. Much more. The only that I know of this model is actually a thing that I think was a collider or maybe a user or something like that, which is in the theorem of all our numbers. Okay, so that there is a well defined growth speed, uh, and actually for every slope, there is a growth speed and it depends on the slope, and then you get some similarity with the slope, but how it depends on the slope. So that's all that's not the good of preparation, so I don't see around that slide, but then it's okay. Um, and the conjecture is that here the direct exponents are again the Brownian exponent in space. So as a function of space for fixed time, it's still supposed to be the Brownian motion after a while. Uh, but in time, now the direct exponent is not two, so it's not parabolic stated anymore by its three half. Um, and the limit is supposed to be non gaussian so for fixed time, it should be supposed to look like a Brownian motion. So the like two point distribution or a point distribution at fixed time, they are Gaussian. But if you look at the joint distribution for different time, that's not Gaussian. And there is a complete characterization at the limit that you're supposed to get, which is called the KTV point. And that was obtained by. Um, and had skin for seven benefits about five years ago. So that's a very recent result, but they didn't show that this process here converges to that limit. They show that another process called the voltage metric consistency process has a scaling limit and conjectures that all these guys have detected. Um, Let me just show you again an animate a sort of movie for that guy, right? So here, whoops, what's happening? Uh, Right. Okay, so here you see the pile of bricks sort of piling up, right? Uh, and if you look at what happens at kind of large scales, it does something like this. Right. So that's the behavior of large scales. Um, and this time, here you do see that actually it's not kind of reversal. So it's a little bit similar to the previous movie, right? So you have something which at fixed time kind of looks like a bond motion in space. It looks more flat here because it wasn't actually being so flat. The way I'm zooming out here is the normal way of zooming out to the fresh space. But I mean, so I think the wrong exponents are kind of flat and picked out of it. Uh, so that's why it looks sort of less spiky if you want. Um, but if you look at it a little bit, what you see is that whenever there's a bump that appears, the bump actually moves towards the high so the housing that actually you can see what's the error of time by looking at the view. Right? So you see these bumps that appear, and then you kind of get broader. Right? You have little mountains, and the mountains get broader. And if you have little valleys, the valleys are still there. Right? So, so this one 
uh, clearly there is an arrow of time. And so the same is still again, clearly, this is going to fix the around. But this time, in terms of the time symmetry, it is still the symmetry, but this time, the symmetry is going to be jointly a time around and turn the function upside down, right? So you can see the values and the values and the values and the values and the values. Uh, if you flip the final one, you turn it into mountains, but the doctor symmetry in the limit, of course, the discrete process doesn't have that. Uh, this is in the system of the limit. Okay, so, so now what's the sort of properties that the limits would have, right? So, firstly, we inherit these properties that I had on the first slide. Um, so you still have translation invariants. Now, one of the important properties that I mentioned was some kind of locality, right? And now by the time you're taking a scaling limit, the sort of approximate locality becomes a strict locality, right? Uh, and that means that you want some sort of space-time map of property. Right? So it's only local in time that will give you map of property. And obviously, since you know the limit is the same thing as the scaling limit, it will be scaling invariant. They use that definition. Um, and well, in both of these examples, one has a description of the limit, at least the conjectured limit in the second example, and one can check that these properties of the standard bucket. If if it wasn't for space, right? So if you think of processes that only depend on time, um what, do the, what does this mean, right? So it would be a process which has uh, stationary increments and the scale invariant. That basically means the state of the process, right? So, so if there was only time, then the processes with that property would be the same as this process. Okay. That's it. And that tells you somehow what the possible exponents are that can show up. And for every exponent, you just have one guy. Or maybe well, maybe you'll get your about of those maybe positive and negative stuff up to the But you know exactly what kind of limit you get. Um in space time, so in the situation we're interested in here, there is no theorem like that whatsoever. Right? So there's absolutely no theorem that gives you some kind of classification of this uh, and in some sense. Almost nothing is known, right? In the sense that it's, it's just not known how many of these guys there are. Like which exponents can actually show up? Is there one for every exponent? Any sort of question like that is open. Um, there's sort of a partial classification in two directions, right? So if there are two and no kind, right? So if you're thinking uh, the difference between you know one dimensional space and one dimensional time and two dimensional space. Uh, is that in two dimensional space, a natural environment is also kind of rotation environment. Right? Whereas, of course, in space time, it's not natural to impose rotation environment in space time. Uh, but if you think of the two dimensions as being two dimensions of space, it's natural to impose rotation invariants. Um, and then what you often get is even a formal invariant, which is called like a local version of rotation and scale invariants. And if you have conformal invariants, then you're sort of in the world of 2D conformal field theories, and there is some kind of classification by the central charge. So, in two dimensions, there is some kind of classification in some sense, but in this one plus one dimension. Now, here is a sort of cartoon, right? So, the, the two examples I gave you so far, uh, we have these two possible scaling limits. So, the first one. We scale to Edward Wilkinson, the second one we scale to the KCD fixed point. Um, and if you want the conjecture of something which is a, to some extent it's a kind of a theorem, but it's still a very vague statement. Um, the picture to have in mind is that if you think of here the screen as being the space of all possible models of this time. Right, which is, of course, not a well-defined space, and it's sort of a huge infinite dimensional thing. Um, 
And then you have an evolution on this space, which is the evolution of just zooming out. I'd right? like, uh, like what I did in the space. Right? You have this little microscopic model, but then you zoom out to look at it from far away. Um, and then you ask yourself, you know, the fixed points of this evolution would be, you know, these objects, these scale invariant objects with sort of interest in it. Um, and so, for example, like this stochastic heat equation here, which would be a fixed point of this operation of zooming out, and you have this KPZ fixed point, which would be another fixed point of this operation of zooming out. And then you can ask yourself, you know, are there like heteroclinic orbits or things like that, right? So are there, for example, like this red line, and so are there models that have the property that if you zoom out, they converge to one fixed point, and if you zoom in, just go backwards here, then it converges to another one. Um, and how many are there? Right? So like, for example, here, you know, the picture is in two directions, so in two directions, there's no space. <laughs> so there's, there's only a space for one possible line that kind of, kind of connects these two fixed points. Well, of course, you should think of this as being a huge interdimensional space. So that it's much larger than this. And so in principle, there could be many lines that connect these two fixed points. Right? So you could imagine that there's like a huge collection of models that all have the property that when you zoom in, you can push to one of them, when you zoom out, you can push to the other one. And indeed, you go in both directions, right? So could you have models that when you zoom in, they converge to the fixed point, the and when you zoom out, they converge to the hyperplexic point. Okay. Um, so that's the sort of questions uh, we want to address. And so, so today, uh, I want to talk kind of just about the, uh, if you want the blue and the red line here. So here, so the blue line, what is that supposed to illustrate? It's supposed to illustrate that one way of getting up the red line, right? Uh, is to create any sort of model that may be dependent on a parameter. But you know that for some values of the parameter, uh, it actually converges to either Wilkinson when you zoom out, and then you perturb it. And so you take a value that's a bit different. Um, and say you have your family of models, which is such that if you make the value a little bit different, then as you zoom out, it converges to, uh, to the state defect point. And then you can imagine taking some kind of joint limit where you sort of send. send Right, so you take the starting point in here, so very close to this green line, which is the basin of attraction of Edward Wilkinson, right? So you perturb a little bit from here. And then if you zoom out, you can imagine that you would get very close to this point here, but now at some point you bifurcate and then you end up converting to this one. And at least from the picture here, sort of intuitively somewhat clear that if you take a joint limit like this, you should end up collapsing onto this red line, right? Um, and so, so here is a kind of conjecture. The conjecture is that basically whenever you do that, uh, you always get the same thing. So that's in vague terms. Uh, that's what the conjecture says. And that thing that you're supposed to get is always the solution to this KPZ equation. So, um, so the KPZ equation is the equation that I wrote down here. That's basically some kind of perturbation of the stochastic heat equation. Because the scale limit is essentially talking about a case quite a symmetric uh, simply excluding process. Um, so this is some sort of normal form. If you want, that's the you know that's the simplest PD that you can write down, or the simplest stochastic PD you can write down. Which is some kind of nonlinear perturbation of this stochastic heat equation, and which depends only on derivatives of it, right? Because we don't want things to depend on the value, right? We already said it should only depend on the shape. And that means that if you write some sort of PD, that means that the right hand side will only depend on derivatives of the function and not on the value themselves. Uh, and then, of course, the simplest nonlinear term that you can write down, which depends on the derivatives, is well, take the first derivative and square it. That's the easiest number in that. So, so in that sense, it's just the simplest equation that you can write down. And the conjecture is there is always that one that you see, some kind of normal form. 
Um, just one remark is that actually, I mean, you can write down this equation like that, but it's kind of slightly tricky uh, to give it a meaning because, well, so here is actually a similar. So if I take, so that was this symmetric simple exclusion. So if I untake this box, and so then that makes it no longer symmetric. And now it's basically supposed to be equation. Uh, and again, you see at fixed time, nothing has changed. It's still a Brownian motion at fixed time. Uh, but the evolution, again, now you actually see the arrow of time because it again has these properties of kind of peaks for now and rising. So, but what you see is that, you know, at fixed time, it's supposed to look like a Brownian motion. Right? And so, you know, this guy here in the right hand side of the equation, you have the square of the derivative. So you're supposed to take the square of the derivative of a Brownian motion, which obviously is a problem. Uh, and so clearly, you have to do some sort of renormalization or something. There's some kind of infinity that you have to subtract. And there's different ways of doing this. So originally, uh, this was supposed to derive. Well, so because it was derived heuristically in the physics literature by Kadar, Parisi, and Jang, so that's the KPC. Um, but then in the math literature, it was first sort of rigorously derived from an actual microscopic model by Bettini and Jacobin in the late 90s. And they, the way they gave a meaning to this equation was by what's called the Hopf pose transformation. So that's sort of the remark that if you take the exponential of H, then, and you write down the equation for that, it's actually a linear equation. It's some sort of against the stochastic heat equation of where the noise instead of just being added to the positive negative. Um, and that you can then make sense of it by just ether integration, uh, ether calculus. And then again, that's kind of formal because you would want to then say, oh, the log of this satisfies this equation. But of course, so if you took the log and just applied the chain rule, then it would, apply, it would solve this equation to solve in the black terms. But now, of course, since you know the equation was written as an Eto equation, you know about allowed to apply the chain rule, you should apply Eto's formula. There's an Eto correction, but the Eto correction is infinite. So that's somehow the minus infinity here, if you want. Um, but there's a more literal way of making sense of this nowadays uh, using regularity structures where you can really make sense of this equation and not just of the exponential, the equation for the exponential of h, and in the sense that, as we're going to see, it's kind of stable under perturbations of this equation. Um, and um, that sort of allows, if you want, to prove theorems that go in the direction of uh, underpinning this conjecture. Okay. Uh, and so, so what I want to do today, so I think I have about 10 minutes left. Um, I want to just present one particular theorem, which is a recent uh, work joined with uh, Andres Karazimovic, who is my PhD student, but has unfortunately left academia to work for a bank, <laughs> as it happens in London. Um, and uh, Konstantin Makatsky is also a former student of mine, who is now a position in space. So here you take noisy mean curvature flow. Okay, so you imagine your, your page, or your interface is a line, one dimensional line uh, in a two dimensional environment. So the environment is this sort of colorful black background here. So you have some random uh, environment with a sort of short correlation length, but it's smooth, right? So you somehow see the fact that it's kind of blurry, that basically means it's smooth, right? Because if I take the level sets of smooth function, it's going to basically look at the image of something blurry like that. Um, it's relatively short range correlations. It tends that here the correlation length is about the diameter of one of these dots, and it's essentially dependent if you go a couple dots away. Um, so you have an environment like this, so that's my heat curve. And then you have this curve, and the way the curve evolves is that at every point you can look at its curvature. So the curvature is just one over the radius of this oscillating circle here. Right? So you take the circle that's most tangent uh, at that point, look at one over its radius. Um, and then the way it evolves is that the speed of the evolution here, so it moves in the normal direction, 
uh, the speed, which is given by one minus uh, this curvature plus a small constant times the uh, value of the environment at that point. Okay. So it moves through this random environment and the environment affects its speed. But it affects it only quite little. Um, and now it's not too difficult. So it's sort of very well known here that if you send epsilon, if epsilon was zero, right? So if you only look at the curvature flow and you take something which is quite flat, right? But which has just sort of little bumps, but it's relatively flat, uh, then actually the mean curvature flow is quite well approximated by just the heat equation, right? So if you first saw that some kind of in the regime where you're very flat, uh, mean curvature is very close to heat equation. Okay. Uh, so in that sense, that bit kind of looks a bit, that part gives rise to something that looks a bit like a heat equation. And then the environment here, uh, well, gives rise to some kind of extra noise uh, to your heat equation. And so you would think that if you, and that's not too difficult to prove, at least for the person repeating, if you rescale this correctly, you can certainly make it convergent. So that's the heat equation. I think that's the uh, theorem. You can prove that. But on the other hand, it is a kind of nonlinear evolution. Um, and if you have nonlinear effects, then what one expects is that generically, the specific one is much more stable than the stochastic heat equation. So generically, things should actually be stable. Uh, to the KPZ equation. And therefore, if you scale this in some sense of large enough scale, but not too large, right? So if you look at the correct scale, you should actually do the KPZ equation. Um, and that's basically a theorem. So here, again, we say we, we start with something flat. So say you, you can just start completely flat, right? Which means if it were deterministic, then it would just stay flat and it would be boring. But since you have the random environment, it's not going to stay flat anyway. You can set up completely flat if you want. Um, and then that means it's a, obviously a graph with just the constant function. Um, and for a small time, it's certainly going to remain a graph. And so you can just write down the evolution for that, uh, the function that gives you the graph. And well, if you do that, you get an equation like this. Right, so this first bit here is somehow mean curvature flow, um, and then you have this extra bit. So this one here comes from the fact that you know the normal speed was one plus mean curvature, and then plus the random noise. And here I write eta u to the eta that evaluated at you know the actual location x comma u of x, so x and t. Okay, so you get some kind of complicated looking uh, PD like this. Um, and the theorem is that, well, you know, if you rescale that, and the way the reason why I chose square root here is precisely so that the rescaling here is with integer exponents, uh, with sort of small integer exponents. In fact, with epsilon here, then the same theorem would be true when you know all the exponents are twice as big. Um, so the theorem is if you do this rescaling and you subtract, so there is a choice of law of large number if you want, right? So there is a choice of constant here to subtract. So if you rescale it at scale epsilon in x and epsilon square in t, or one of epsilon in x, one of epsilon square in t, then it does indeed converge to the uh, KPZ equation. In general, with a possible drift, what I mean by a drift is that you might also have to um, move, you, you might want to look at instead of x, you want to like look at x minus constant times t. Right? So it might actually have a constant velocity drift uh, in one direction, which is the case if the environment, if like the correlation function of the environment is not isotropic. Mm -hmm. so if the environment has a correlation function that doesn't kind of respect the symmetry of the space, uh, then that might actually generate somehow an additional or the one drift in one direction. It is metric that drift is there. Um, so, so let me just show you so for formal calculation. So if you take this equation here, uh, so the equation for the graph here, 
and then you just rescale it according to the scaling and you subtract something like that. Um, then you can just write down what you get. You get something horrible looking, but I can just write it down in this way for some functions f1, f2, f3, which happens to be kind of smooth and even functions um, that are basically one. At, oh, I see that I put too many halves. So I added the half here, so that means that that should be the one. Matter. Um, so you would think formally, you would think that these arguments there get small, right? Because there's an epsilon in them. And so it should be not, not too bad an approximation to just replace <clears throat> these functions by their value at zero. And that function here, the last one, f1, is zero at zero, the one that's in red. And therefore, well, at least formally, you would think, well, that's your theorem, right? It's sort of trivial. If you just replace these guys by their value at zero, then this becomes a one, this becomes a one, this becomes a zero, so it drops out. And what's written here is just the KPZ equation, right? So obviously that should be the answer. Um, why is it not easy to actually prove this? Because if you, you know, do a sort of back of the envelope calculation to see how big these things really are, you find that, well, in the limit, h is not going to be differential. So the derivative of h is actually going to blow up. It's not going to blow up too badly. It's actually going to blow up like one over square root of x, right? Which is sort of natural because it's going to look essentially like an epsilon approximation to a brand new motion, right? And if you do that, then the derivative would be about one over square root of x because of the Brownian scaling, right? So this is quite natural. Um, it's easy to guess. And then the second derivative, well, you basically lose an epsilon for every derivative in x because of the scaling in space. So you'd expect this to behave about black epsilon to the minus three halves. So now these functions are even, and that means that they approach their value at zero quadratically, right? So the error that you make by replacing them just by the value at zero is about the square of the argument. The argument here is about size square root of epsilon. Epsilon times the derivative, the derivative is like one over square root, so it's like square root of epsilon. When you square it, it's like epsilon, right? So the blue guys and the red guy, they all should be about epsilon away from the limiting value. That sounds good, right? It certainly goes to zero. But then the guy that it gets multiplied with here, well, that guy is actually precisely of size one of epsilon, right? So you have something that you know, you make an error on the epsilon in the blue guy, but then it gets amplified by one of epsilon. And then that can certainly create a normal one effect. And here it's worse, right? Because you make an error of all the epsilon, but the noise guy itself is actually multiplied by epsilon to the minus three half, right? And so the error that you make is one over square root of epsilon, right? So it blows up. Uh, and same for the last term, right? So here you have an epsilon, but the second derivative is of epsilon to the three half. So both of these terms here, uh, you're going to make an error by just replacing the value of these functions by the value at zero. You're going to make an error that actually blows up by one over square root of epsilon. And so clearly that sort of formal calculation is not going to give you a proof in any sense. Right? Uh, and so you really have to exploit kind of stochastic cancellations to see that, you know, these errors that blow up actually average out, either average out to zero, which they actually don't, uh, but end up averaging out to constants that get uh, canceled out by the correct choice of that constant C epsilon. Right? So the idea then is that if you choose that constant C epsilon in just the right way, then that cancels out the main contribution of these errors. And it turns out that that contribution is basically just like a constant. And actually, even that's not true, because as I mentioned on the previous slide, depending on whether the noise is homogeneous or not, you can actually end up with, you know, picking up an additional drift. And that really means that the errors that you make end up creating a term which is of the order constant times dxh. So that the, the equation you get at the limit is not actually 
what you would get by simply replacing these functions for the value at zero, but you get an action, an additional term, which is constant times dx h uh, in the right hand side of the equation. So it really changes the equation. Okay. Um, so not quite as trivial as one might think by just looking at the formal calculation. And yeah, so, okay, so I had a the one side gives you an idea of proof, but okay, that's somewhat technical anyway. Uh, and so thank you for your attention and I'll we'll see you tomorrow morning. <laughs>